color still you're looking at is of my two children and myself. I inserted the photo into the documentary as Alfred Hitchcock used to insert a surprised appearance of himself into all of his films. The objective of displaying this photo, however, is to let audiences know that if anyone in my family back in the day had applied to one of those historically black colleges or universities I told you about earlier, the only one who probably would have been accepted would have been my son, Bird. My daughter, Deirdre, or Didi, as we call her affectionately, might have gotten into the college by the skin of her teeth, but Mama Nance would have been persona non grata, not light enough, you understand. Thank goodness times and values have changed today in most pockets of the African-American community. While I was reminiscing about jocks of yesteryear, I failed to mention someone who was equally as popular as both Alan Freed and Tommy Smalls. His name is Jerry Blavitt. He hailed out of the Philadelphia area, and like a number of other white DJs of that time, Blavitt loved black music, much to the chagrin of many around him. Like Dick Clark, also out of Philly, and who had made the daily afternoon dance show American Bandstand a must-see for Bobby Soxer's Nationwide, Blavitt's name also was lauded throughout the record industry, but his playlist was more soulful than Clark's. He grooved to the tunes that weren't necessarily played on bandstand. Calling himself the Geeter with the Heater, Blavitt's career spanned beyond the doo era and is yet considered an icon in the central New Jersey and the Philadelphia area. And... He was recognized when PBS aired its doo specials during its fundraising drive several years ago. While doo itself was the rage in many black neighborhoods and in some white neighborhoods, as quiet as it's kept, gospel music sung by black artists also received A-list status, if you will, at least among churchgoers from communities of color. The Songs of Zion, as they were often called, were belted out in many of those black churches or rented halls like the Laurel Gardens in Newark. And the Pentecostal churches came in with the whole packet, tambourines, drums, sometimes a washboard, and always a piano or organ. They sang to the glory of God. One superstar from that time also hailed from Philadelphia. They called her Sister Rosetta Thorne. Look down, look down, that don't The woman could play a guitar, in my judgment, as well as Chuck Berry could play his. Tharp would drive the church community crazy because she wasn't above switching back and forth from gospel to blues. She excelled at both, thank you. Here we see her in early footage singing The Lonesome Road with Lucky Melinda and his orchestra. The lady could fill a stadium. Though in my opinion, she was as popular as Mahalia Jackson, at least in the minds of many black folks, perhaps she wasn't exactly what mainstream society was looking for and didn't get the crossover recognition to the degree that Jackson did. Unlike Tharp, however, Clara Ward and the Ward singers did indeed cross over and garner international appeal. This Philadelphia group led by Ward herself and backed by some of her sisters, could be seen on any given afternoon performing on the Mike Douglas show with everything they had. Douglas hosted a very popular daily talk show, and the Ward singers were frequent guest artists. Initially, Ward and her siblings sang together with their mother. 
It is believed by many that Clara Ward and the late Reverend C.L. Franklin, father of Queen of Soul Aretha Franklin, dated each other for years. Black gospel singers were in abundance in Philly, whether you're talking about Marian Anderson, the great contralto, the Dixie Hummingbirds led by the late Ira Tucker. The Hummingbirds covered Paul Simon's song, Love Me Like a Rock, and it was a hit for them as well. The great Ethel Waters, also known as Sweet Mama String Bean, came out of Philly, and I could go on and on. Black female performers, while singing beautifully, were sometimes ripped off as much or perhaps more than their male counterparts. I mentioned Big Mama Thornton earlier, but there still were others not noted for their gravel voices or earthy lyrics, and they too suffered the same fate. Believe it or not, one such person was Althea Gibson. Yes, that one. The first African-American tennis star and the first to win a Grand Slam in the mid-50s. In 1958, Gibson recorded a jazz LP or album. And although the album itself went nowhere on the charts, Gibson had a lovely voice. Here, you be the judge. So much to live for, to work and to play. I don't know who managed her, but surely she could have played the club circuit and people probably would have come out simply because of her tennis notoriety. For some reason, Gibson was quite embittered before she died, according to many who knew her. She was a native daughter of New Jersey and almost became a total recluse in her declining years. But no one can question the fact that this woman could sing. Another black vocalist could have become great, perhaps, if she hadn't been overshadowed by her very beautiful, very famous sibling, Dorothy Dandridge. Her name was Vivian Dandridge, and like Gibson, she put out a jazz album that went absolutely nowhere, but one always thinks about what might have been. Vivian and Dorothy were estranged for years. In fact, Vivian didn't even attend her sister's funeral, indicating that Dorothy knew that she loved her. Whatever. And then there's the incomparable Dinah Washington, whose real name was Ruth Jones. Oh, I think I failed to mention that most of these women who sang blues, jazz, rock and roll, or pop all had their beginnings in the black church. In fact, Washington used to sing with the Roberta Martin Singers, a famous black gospel group from Chicago. Martin established a publishing house in the 1930s and was said to have purchased the mansion of the great cosmetic maven, Helena Rubinstein. Unfortunately, when Donna Washington became famous, known as Queen of the Blues, the church community ostracized her. But I already told you, the narrow-minded, so-called saints of God did that often. In fact, she wanted to become involved in one of the religious organizations in Chicago, but wasn't allowed. She paid her dues anyhow. At the end of the day, her singing spoke and still speaks for itself. One kiss and I was a flame. Have you got eyes? Then tell me what's your name. Only a moment ago. You might have gone by, and I'd never know. It's hard to believe I was lonely. Mm, only a moment ago. And then there was the issue of white artists covering songs made famous on the black record charts by black singers. Etta James felt the sting of such outrageous racist behavior. Back in the 1950s, Etta 
recorded a song called Rock With Me Henry. A bit risque for those times, but it was a hit on black stations. Hey, baby, what do I have to do to make you love me too? Got to roll with me, Henry. All right, baby. Roll with me, Henry. Don't mean maybe. Roll with me, Henry. In the old time. Roll with me, Henry. Don't change my mind. Roll with me, Henry. All right. You better roll it while it rolling is on. Roll on. There also was a singer named Georgia Gibbs. As I said to you earlier, Gibbs and her handlers were always able to take a hit record of a black artist, cover it, and get nationwide airplay and more money to boot. Much more money. Such was the case with Roll With Me Henry. The record company that Gibbs sang for changed the words to Dance With Me Henry. Gibbs sang it, and the rest is history. It was a major hit. Gibbs and her people did this all the time. The beautiful Lena Horne once said, the only way to win is to try to outlive them all, whoever all was in her life. Well, Etta James went on to do well and still was performing when she died in 2012. Gibbs seemed to return to oblivion from whence she came. Etta's story was told in the movie Cadillac Records, where she was immortalized, portrayed by Beyonce. So James is still popular, even though she is no longer with us. This is just a short snippet regarding the history of black music, doo-wop, gospel, rock and roll. There's much more to be told, and I hope some of those who still are alive from that era will put pen to paper and tell their own stories. They certainly can tell it better than I.